Hey, everybody. Um, how many people before you saw the schedule had ever heard of Chartbeat? And I imagine no one. Excellent, as I expected. Um, <laughs> uh, before I get started, I'll warn you, I'm from New York. I talk fast. I'm going to try to slow down a little bit. I might say some funny things, but uh, you know, that's, that is what it is. So let's get started. Uh, so yeah, the topic of this talk is uh, a year with Apache Aurora. Um, I put a little asterisk there because it's actually been almost two years at this point since I submitted the, started submitting the talk, and uh, it's been yeah, maybe 18 months we've actively been uh, using Aurora. Um, so, let's see. There we go. Okay, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first, who is Chartbeat? Because as we've established, no one has ever heard of us. Um, what our architecture looks like. Um, how or and why we adopted uh, Mesos and, and Aurora, um, how we act actually use Aurora, and then we're going to take a deeper look into some of the interesting features that we found. So about Chartbeat, uh, we're 75 employees. Uh, we're eight years old, venture capital-backed startup uh, in New York City. Um, we have somewhere north of 20 engineers. That includes front-end engineers, data scientists, um, and a bunch of back-end engineers. And my team, which is uh, five of us, and we're the platform and DevOps team. Um, we call ourselves the Platypus team. Um, and that five includes myself and also our CTO, who unfortunately is usually in meetings. So, uh, but he's a really good programmer, so we like it when we get him. Uh, we're in New York City. Uh, we're, if you know New York, we're just south of Union Square, above the Strand Bookstore. It's an awesome location. Um, and we're entirely hosted on AWS. And every engineer at our organization pushes code all the time. Um, so who, wh what do we do? So this is the marketing slide. Uh, you know, they gave me a couple I had to put in here. Um, and our mission statement is we are the content intelligence platform that empowers storytellers, audience builders, and analysts to drive the stories that change the world. And our customers are the press. So we work for most of the large news, news agencies, um, online magazines, big blogs, everyone from the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, BBC, um, a lot of, uh, of, of uh, uh, the press in Europe, and uh, we get a lot of traffic. So um, basically, the short story is we put a little JavaScript on everyone's page, and that pings us all the time. And we can measure how far a user went, how long they spent reading a page, and all that. And it turns out to be about 300,000 requests a second coming in just uh, with those JavaScript pings. Um, we have, we're on 50, 000, over 50,000 websites around the world, and we track about 50 billion site uh, page visits a month. So, okay, this is what it looks like. So we have, oh, oh I just went too far. Just trying to get the uh, laser pointer here. Okay, so I forgot the laser pointer. So we have uh, dashboards, um, real-time, historic, and video dashboards. And when our customers log in, they get a pretty view in real time of how people are using their page. Um, so you could, this is... Uh, PRI, uh, Public Radio International, they're one of the customers that lets us use their, their data. Um, and they currently have 494 people on their, I believe this is probably their home page. Um, I did this early in the morning, so you know, the, the traffic picks up. Um, and the average time someone spends on this page is 45 seconds. You can drill into all the different pages, you can pivot on author and section and all that cool stuff. And we also uh, do optimization. So we have something we call the heads-up display. When you go on to your website, and this is nrc.nl, uh, you can see these, uh, these bars that show what, how each of the click-throughs is behaving on every page on your site. So they use this to decide, hey, you know, that story down there um, about Obama is doing really well. Let's keep it on the home page. This, the one next to it, uh, something about Quebec, sorry I don't read Dutch, uh, isn't doing that well, they might want to push that down or do something else with it. Or move it up if they want to put it in a better position. So maybe they want to swap that and get more traffic going to that story if they want. So I think it's really important in any talk like this to understand what the or how the organization approaches software engineering. Um, I don't think we're quite unique, but we definitely have our own way of doing things. So this is my favorite quote. I try to use it any time I give a talk. It's really old. It's one of the quotes that inspired me when I was like 22 years old, right out of college, engineering. And it's by Larry Wall, who uh, wrote Perl. And he said in the first edition of the Programming Perl book, we will encourage you to develop the three great virtues of a programmer, laziness, impatience, and hubris. 
And he got some pushback on this, and so in follow-up editions, they expanded on what they really meant. And they don't mean I should be lazy, they mean that I should be actively writing code to allow myself to be lazy. Right? I shouldn't be lazy. I should be lazy because the computer is not programming fast enough for me. It's not giving me back my response. So I'm going to write code to make it do things faster. And if you don't have a lot of hubris, you can't be an engineer because you have to believe that you can do anything and make that computer do what you want. So how does this translate into Chartbeat's uh, uh, engineering standards? So the platform team wrote a mission statement because they told us we had to. Um, it was some sort of OKR, KPI thing. And we came up with this, that our mission is to build an effective, efficient platform and secure development platform for Chartbeat engineers. Because we believe that an efficient and effective development platform leads to fast execution. So how do we operate in a day-to-day -day basis? And like I said, I don't think this is unique. Um, it's definitely unique compared to engineering 25 years ago when I started. Um, when we had CVS. Um, so Git is the source of truth for everything, right? We store our configurations for our entire Amazon infrastructure in Git, um, so we can always reproduce it anytime we want. Um, everything that gets deployed is deployed by a Git hash, except for Java stuff. Uh, we use semantic versioning for that. Um, we might be able to fix that later, but um, engineers run the code on their laptop. They run it in a dev environment. They run it in a production environment. We prefer the command line. Everyone likes to do things from the command line. Um, I'm probably one of the few that actually uses an IDE because I'm old, and I like IDEs because they didn't exist when I was a kid. Um, but other people just use Vim or whatever. Um, we prefer writing scripts to memorizing commands, right? Um, because my brain is full of other things other than esoteric commands. Um, and we don't reinvent things that work. We're small. We make templates, and we write scripts to automate things. Um, as far as programming, we are almost exclusively Python and Clojure, um, with the exception of JavaScript for the front end, um, but I don't understand that. I don't use it. Um, so why Mesos? Why now? We're eight years old. We're by, you know, everyone seems to think we're a very successful company in our industry. Um, so why would we make such a big switch? So I feel like the freedom to innovate is a result of a successful product, right? We want to set ourselves up for the next five years. Um, you know, Chartbeat's gotten to this great point. We have a lot of customers. You know, we're, we have good revenue. Where do we want to be five years from now? So that's what this project was about. Um, we wanted to reduce our server footprint to save money, as a lot of folks have mentioned here. Um, we want to provide faster, more reliable service to our customers. We wanted to migrate all of our jobs in one year to whatever uh, system we decided to use. Um, and while we're doing that, we want to pay off tech debt, right? Because you're going to take the effort to move a bunch of jobs over to a new system. You should probably address, you know, hey, does this job really need to be here anymore? Should we spend a couple of days tightening it up, doing whatever? And you got stuff running that, hey, oh my god, that's still running? It's been up for five years and no one knew. Um, so let's not move that. Um, most importantly, we wanted to make life better for our engineers, right? We wanted happy engineers. Um, so come to today. We have a, a moderate-sized cluster compared to what I've heard around here. We have uh, 1,350 cores in our, in our cluster. And almost everything that we run is now in Mesos. OK, so what's a happy engineer? So happy engineers are productive engineers, because engineers want to be productive, right? You got into this industry because you're curious. You want to build stuff. And if you can't build that, you're going to get frustrated. So they like uneventful on-call rotations. Like a lot of companies our size, every engineer is on call. Right, it's a one week on call with a backup person. You get woken up in the middle of the night. You're like, dude, I just got woken up. This sucks, right? Um, so they don't want to have to do anything when they're on call. Um, they want to push things quickly. You know, they don't want to have to jump through hoops to get their code into production. They want to be able to monitor and debug their applications easily. They want to be able to scale their applications. Um, really, they want to. And when I, I should say, when I'm talking about engineers now, I'm talking about our product engineers, the guys who we work for. They want to write product code, right? They want to write JavaScript. They want to write Python APIs. They don't want to mess with DevOps. So they want self-service DevOps that's easy to use. And that's what we set out to build. So what did we do first? So before Mesos, we had a lot of Puppet, right? Um, we had Hira roles in Puppet that mapped to Amazon AWS tags for the instances. Uh, we built virtual ENVs into Debians for our Python code so that we could uh, capture all the dependencies. Mostly, we had single-purpose servers. Uh, we use Fabric to go in and restart jobs and stuff like that. 
It is flexible. I mean, Puppet's great. It, it's very flexible, but it's really complicated, right? You've got Ruby, and you've got Hira, and it, it's, it's, it's really complicated. So say you have this project Foo, right? Foo had an API service, a Kafka consumer, some cron job workers that go and do some database roll-ups and stuff, and you, you basically build out Foo API 01, 02, 03, 04, 05. Foo, uh, Kafka consumer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 16. Right? And then all these workers. So you, have all, you basically just scale out horizontally with your single app. So what happens when we've got a whole bunch of apps? You know, all of a sudden, Foo has a whole bunch of servers, Bar has a whole bunch of servers, Baz has a whole bunch of servers. We found ourselves with 773 EC2 instances. Um, you know, for a, a company with 25 people, that's, that, that, or 25 engineers, that's a lot. Um, during the US election last year, we broke 1,000 instances, and we were like, that's a lot. Um, we had 125 different roles in Puppet. It was really hard on DevOps. It was confusing for the product engineers. We wasted resources. It was really hard to scale. So we started looking at it, and we said, you know, we're at, use, wasting something like 40, 50% of our CPU and RAM. And that's just not really cool. So we decided that whatever we built had to allow us to solve the Python dependency management solution problem for once and for all. It had to play nicely with our current workflow. We didn't want to tell all of our engineers, oh, now you have to do it all this way, right? Because they're used to doing things their way. Um, so it had to be hackable so that we could kind of customize it and tweak it. It had to be open source. We only use open source software with the exception of some Amazon databases. Um, it had to be supported by an active community that's actually using this stuff in the real world. Um, it had to allow us to slow do this migration over time, right? And it had to make our engineers happy. So we chose Aurora. I'm not going to get into why we chose Aurora. Happy to have a beer later if you want to talk about that compared to, and I've also, by the way, written a couple blog posts about this where I get into some of the details of why we chose Aurora versus uh, Marathon. So um, what is Aurora? If you haven't used Aurora, it's a Mesos framework for long-running processes and cron jobs. It was built by Twitter. Uh, it was based on Borg. They had an engineer who had previously worked on Borg. Um, they, it, it, they launched it at Twitter in 2010 and it joined the Apache Incubator in 2013. I'm not quite sure when it became a top-level project, but I'm sure someone here knows. Um, they're currently on release 018, and about every six months they roll a new release. The new releases always support the latest Mesos version. Um, it's got a very active user community, and it's written in Java and Python. So basically, this is Aurora. Um, you know, over on the left side, you have a, a, a framework that's registered in Mesos. There's an agent that runs on each of, of your servers that receives the, uh, the instructions to go ahead and launch a new job. Um, everything in Aurora runs inside a sandbox container, right? So you get a directory, it's a troot, um, and in there all your stuff goes, and your, whatever user you launch the job as has, has permissions for that troot. Um, they have an uh, observer which basically lets you, uh, through a UI, come in and, and look at your jobs. Uh, you can look at the log files and that sort of stuff. Um, and they have an executor that monitors the life of the job. So they define things as jobs. So a job might be an API server, and at, say I want 42 of them, right? So you, that's 42 tasks. Um, and Mesos goes ahead and schedules them. Inside Thermos is the, the, the uh, executor. Inside Thermos, you get processes. So you can run multiple things in, in parallel, in pipelines. Uh, something can install a job, then run a job, health checkers, that sort of thing. So those are all processes. Um, so some of the features of Aurora that we've found useful. So all the job templating is in Python, which means you can do anything, right? And everyone loves Python these days. Um, one problem that we had with, uh, with Puppet instances is when something died it, or it got wedged, which is a very technical term that we like to use, someone had to actually log into the machine, restart it, figure out what's going on. Now, if, if a process gets wedged, the health checker in Aurora will say, hey, that, that thing's not doing whatever you said the health uh, check was. Like, it's, I don't see anything in the log file. I can't hit this port. It kills it, reschedules it, no one cares. It, no one even knows. I mean, we obviously do know, but no one has to do anything. Um, it's, it has a very hackable CLI, which I'm going to get into. Um, it does service uh, discovery using Finagle through Zookeeper. Uh, you can map ports, obviously, all around. It has a good API. And something that I actually found really cool that I, I, I initially thought was kind of weird was the uh, way they name jobs by uh, 
cluster, uh, organization, uh, environment, and then the job name, which helps in Zookeeper and in all of our metrics for knowing what's what. So this is how, uh, uh, what we, they call a dot aurora file um, looks. That, that this is where you define your job description in Aurora. So every job, in, in, in basic Aurora, you have a, an Aurora file which can define multiple jobs. Um, they're Python, as I said, and the processes are basically any kind of Unix thing that you can do. So in this case, we define the path to some, this is the hello world from the Aurora website, by the way. I took a couple things out because they were esoteric. Um, so you define the name of the script you want to run. You have a process, which is you're going to call installer. Um, you're going to name it fetch package. And it's going to go and copy the thing from this directory slash vagrant into your local sandbox. It's going to um, print something saying, hey, I did this. And then it's going to uh, make it executable and run it. I'm sorry, make it executable. The next process runs it. Right? So I had one that installed it. Now this one's going to run it. So it goes ahead and just calls Python. It's just, you know, obviously just a Unix command line statement. So then I go ahead and I link those two things together. So I'm going to do an install, and then I'm going to run hello world. And I need one CPU, uh, mega RAM, and eight megs of disk to do so. And I call that hello world task. So then I go ahead and define my top level job. Um, and I say it's going to run on the dev cluster. It's going to run as the user devel. Um, I'm sorry, in the environment devel, there's devel, prod, and test environments. Um, I'm going to run it using the www.data user. Um, call it hello world, and go ahead and it runs it. So, you know, I find that DevOps is a balance between flexibility and reliability, right? You want to let your, your users do what they want to do, but you need to be safe, right? You, you want to protect them from doing silly things, and at the same time, make your job as a DevOps engineer easier, because if you know how things are running, if you have control over it, you can manage it. If you let your users kind of do whatever they want, that's great until it becomes a nightmare for you. So we wanted to make this much more kind of uh, more structured. And the reason is because when we looked at the work that we do, almost everything we do falls into three categories, right? We have Kafka consumers that read off of Kafka, write to a database or to another Kafka uh, topic. We have workers that listen to a rabbit queue and get work, and then they go and most of them do something like take an hour's worth of data from this database and turn it into a five-minute roll-up or copy some stuff from here to there. And then we have APIs, right? So we have Clojure consumers, uh, Kafka consumers, we have Python workers, and we have Python API servers. That's pretty much like 95% of the stuff we do. So big decision time. What do we want to do? So we decided we're going to adopt Pants, obviously adopt Aurora, that's the, the one I already uh, let you know. We're going to adopt Pants, and I'll talk about Pants in a second. We're going to wrap this Aurora command line interface with our own client that we can add some more kind of control around, uh, and I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, we're going to create a library of Aurora templates that make it easy to do repetitive things like pull uh, an artifact from S3, drop it in here, make it executable, and run it. Um, we're going to just let Aurora do its thing. We've always had issues with log file management. It's like one of these old, the oldest problems in the book is, you know, oh, file handles, damn it, you know, my disk's filling up. And so we said, you know, Aurora let, has a disk quota. So when a job is, hits that quota, it kills the job, it restarts it, and then it goes through periodically and cleans out all the sandboxes. So we just let, let, let it do that. Um, and we're going to not even bother with, with containers. So at the point we did, made this decision, the, uh, there was no Docker support in Aurora. Um, and we don't use Docker. We use it a little bit, but not very much. So we didn't really care about that. We said, we're just going to go with these sandboxes. That sounds fine to us. So how do we make Aurora fit into our workflow? So the uh, .aurora file is very powerful. You can really do anything. You can define a whole bunch of jobs and go ahead and run them. But that gets very confusing, because you, as a DevOps engineer, you no longer know what's running everywhere. So we decided we're going to take all the common config options out of the Aurora file and put them in a YAML file. Um, things like how many CPUs do you need, how much RAM do you need, that sort of stuff. Um, flags that, uh, that you might want to pass to a command line. And then the Aurora files become much more simple. Um, we decided that we're going to require you know, version artifacts built by our server, which is what we did before. Um, 
but we actually tie that into the client. So if you, you, you have to specify the git hash in our YAML file for what you want to deploy, and our client actually checks to make sure that thing exists before you try to launch it. So we put in some safety nets for our, our product engineers. Um, you also have to be on master if you want to push something to the production, uh, the, the production environment, um, because people do silly things, especially at 2 in the morning when they get woken up. Um, so we also decided that every YAML file specifies one job. That job could be running devel, test, prod, whatever, but uh, one, uh, multiple YAML files can actually point to the same Aurora file, which has the definitions of how the job runs. And I'll talk about that in a sec. It gets very interesting. Um, all of our configs, as I mentioned, already live in the repo, which makes it really easy to find jobs. So we have one directory where all of the job configurations are. You can go and grep and you know, replace stuff, and it, it's very easy to make major changes or to figure out what's running where. And then we also added some additional functionality for things like tailing log files as they're running. Um, so what's the difference? So on the top, this is uh, what it takes to run fooserver.aurora. On the top is the basic Aurora command line uh, to do it. So you say Aurora create. There's also Aurora um, uh, update, which will do a rolling up update. You can do a restart. You can do a kill. Um, and then you name the job. So remember I said the, these, they have these funny names. So it's AA is the cluster name. Um, we have AA and BB because one of our guys used to work at Google, and apparently that's what they do. Um, AA, and then CBOps is the name of the user. And then it's running in production. It's called Foo Server and a path to the Aurora file. So the way we do it, so we have this Aurora manage command. Uh, it mimics all of the commands, but it, 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 it maps to that YAML file, and it pulls out all the stuff that you're not going to remember, like the name of the user that it's running under. Because if someone launches this job with a different user, that could cause havoc, right? Um, and we have to specify whether we want it to run in dev or prod, because engineers launch things, they mistype it, and they launch things in the wrong place. So it's about a safety net. So this YAML file that we've designed um, at, at the top uh, has information about the job. So this is for a, a, a thing called 8-Ball that does one of our, uh, one of our dials on our dashboard. Um, it runs as, so you specify the, 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 the file is the Aurora file that's going to run. The user is running as CBE. Um, the build name refers to an artifact that's going to be found in S3, and in this case, it's called 8-Ball. We're launching this by Git, so we also allow versions for Java things. We have a static type for things like third-party things like Grafana that you know, we just kind of build once and deploy. Um, and then all of your configurations. So these are the things that most people are going to want to change frequently. And then we allow you to specify things that you're going to use in a, in, a, in a way that we've defined in your Aurora file, like arguments, command line arguments to your whatever your, your, the thing that you're running is. Um, and we allow you to override this for different stages. Uh, it's very common, you know, in, in dev I want two of them, and in prod I want 56 of them. You know, in dev I want these command line arguments, in prod I want these command line arguments. So, we specif so we, we, we've broken it out so you can override them. Um, and you always have to specify a git hash. So, pants. Um, pants is, here's my one slide on what pants is. Um, we discovered Pants because they use it to build Aurora. It's also from Twitter. Um, you can find it on pantsbuild.io. So it's a build system for big mono repos, um, especially Python ones. They do support other things, but as far as I know, I've never seen anyone use anything but Python, um, and it's, it's awesome. So if you are familiar with Maven, it's essentially Maven for Python. Um, and it creates PEX files. PEX files are executable Python directories. So basically what it does is it takes all of your dependencies, so you know you need PyAML and you want request 2.3 and all this stuff, um, which is a problem when you're trying to deploy multiple things on one server, right? Because it's all at the top level. Um, so instead of a virtual environment, it basically builds a directory with all of your dependencies, all of your code, any extra resources like YAML files or other config files, and it puts them all in a zip file and it makes it executable. So you now have one artifact with all of your Python stuff in one place. And we tag, that, tag them with a git hash. We name it for whether it's built up for trusty or precise or whatever. And we upload it to S3 from our, uh, from our Jenkins. Um, so it has directory level build files, which is kind of, uh, it's a lot of files, but it's actually very, very flexible. Um, and it, the reason for this is it does incremental builds for mono repo. So if you make a change in some Python code here, you don't want to kick off a build of everything. 
it can figure out what else in your repo depends on that file change and just build that, right? Um, so we have no more repo level dependency conflicts. You can even specify different versions of third party stuff. Um, it was, this was a big migration. So we decided early, everything's going to Aurora, and by the way, it has to get pants before it goes to Aurora. Um, you know, we obviously helped our product engineers to do this. And it was a great way of uh, getting rid of some tech debt. So what's pants look like? This is a pants build file for the Fiddler server. That's another one of, that's one of our API servers. Um, so you basically, you basically specify the entry point into your code and dependencies which are either relative to your code or they're somewhere else in your repo or they're third party. So this will include PyAML, it'll include a handler's directory, um, some of our, our, our in-house uh, login utils and memcache utils, um, Sharknado 3, which is our API server because people love naming things, um, and the Sharknado 3 uh, G event uh, plugin, which we use. And there's also some constants YAML file that needs to get included in there. All this gets put in one directory, tartar zipped up, and made executable. Um, it's like magic. And this will build fiddler server dash git hash dash trusty and uh, x86.64.pex. So the next thing we did was write a bunch of templates for doing common things. Um, so we wrote, since the Aurora file is just Python, we wrote a whole bunch of templates to automate the common things people wanted to do, like installers. So we have installers to install jars, tars, pex files, gzips, whatever, that are found in various S3 uh, directories. Pull them in and drop them, right? No one needs to know how to do that. It's, it's like someone did it once. Um, J, JVM and uh, JMX configuration options, all sorts of environment stuff. Um, if you have to create a config file based on some inputs and drop that into your, your troop before your thing runs, we support that. Very easy. Um, access credentials, we install all these with Puppet on the machines, um, but they're all, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're hidden and stuff like that, and so uh, we have ways to get to that. We also have shared resources, you know, here's, here's the list of all the databases, here's all the Kafka brokers, here's all the, the zookeepers and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then supporting actors in this, uh, in this world. So we have this thing called auth proxy that every API has to run that authenticates users against the database for, for different APIs. Um, someone wrote that once, we just have a one-liner to drop it in and use it. Um, Aurora uses uh, these, all these health checkers. They have an HTTP health checker, um, and we wrote ones that tell log files, um, proxy another service to see if it's up, and someone just says, oh, I want to use that health check, no problem. All right. So uh, this is what one of our Aurora files looks like for 8-Ball. So Aurora makes heavy use of this thing called Pistachio, and that's uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a type-safe dict in Python. Um, it's almost like a struct, um, and it allows mustache templates to replace things either at, uh, at the time when you define the job or once it's been assigned to a server, right? So something like the, port, the HTTP port, you don't know until it's been assigned to a server. Something like the name of my, my, my SQL database, I know up front when I want to run it. So it allows for different evaluation times so things can be added in. So Aurora uh, exposes uh, Pistachio templates for the port mappings and that sort of thing. Um, the, the instance uh, ID, the name of the server, and we wrote our own for doing things that we need to do. Um, so it works by adding all these, uh, these, these profiles. So we have, uh, we define a bunch of profiles up top that we're going to bind later on. Um, you can see in this ops thing, uh, someone's defining command line arguments for the API server that's going to run. Um, so here's our memcache servers. They're in the services struct. Uh, the port is, uh, is, is, is defined by thermos executor. Um, and it allows you to just, if you give any string into this, uh, this port stick, it'll assign a port with that name and then you can use it later. We use private. Um, it says private, public, you know, the JMX port, all these ports are, are assigned. Um, down here you say, I, I need to run 8-ball. Um, here's a command line. You want to run the PEX file that I put in that struct up there and the options from that thing over there, and it creates a command line. Then I want to add in auth proxy, so it's just a one-liner. I want auth proxy. I want this health check uh, that is going to check my API server at this URL. Um, with this port that is going to be assigned later. Um, and then I want to run these first two things. I need to install 8-Ball and run 8-Ball, but then don't stop. Let that keep going. And then 
go ahead and install this auth proxy in this health check process. Um, so we've kind of defined these pipelines that you can use to define how your things are going to run. Um, and then finally, you define the job. And uh, you go ahead and you bind all these profiles, and Aurora runs it. So we've taken this kind of this idea of our custom templates a step further. We have uh, 104 workers that are doing basically the same thing. They listen to a rabbit queue, and they run some stuff. And it's actually, you know, we have this thing called Igor, which is our worker framework. And the difference between one worker job and another worker job is what are they listening to and some imports, right, some Python imports, uh, because you don't want to import the giant data science library for something that's not using it. Um, so we decided to just take, remember I said that you can have multiple YAML job definitions pointing to the same Aurora config. So we said, all right, let's have one Aurora config for all of our workers, and then just define YAML for all the different ones. So now if someone wants to add a worker, they just have to write a little bit of YAML and say, use this, you know, this is the, the rabbit queue you want to listen to, and this is uh, some command line arguments. So right now in our Aurora config directory where we store everything, and we have 104 of these defined, and you can see some of the different, uh, different ones. So Elasticsearch indexing is a big one. So then we took it a step further, and we created an ETL pipeline called Deepwater. Um, because someone who may or may not be sitting in the front row wanted to name something after an oil spill. Um, <laughs> but Deepwater actually uh, lets you define a whole workflow that runs in Aurora jobs. So you can define these, uh, your steps as Python classes, and then each step in the pipeline gets its own Aurora job. And you can give different requirements, different resource requirements to different steps in the job. Um, you can scale them out uh, uh, however you want. But it also uses Postgres for consistency. So if a job fails, it's marked to Postgres, and we know. So that's only part of the story. So before deploying anything, we had to figure out the re you know, we want to use Aurora. OK, now how do we solve every other problem with this migration? Right, so here's some things that we had to deal with. So request routing, metrics and monitoring, log file collection, configuration management, and bunch of other stuff, right? So how did we do this? So the first one is routing, right? So how do you route traffic as jobs move around the cluster? So we used to do this where you know, we, a job was running on Foo API 01, and it was always going to run on Foo, Foo API 01. And you know what? If Foo API 01 crashes because it's Amazon, we're going to launch another Foo API 01, right? And it's always going to be you know, port 9,000 for this, 9,001 for that. This is obviously changing. So we introduced HAProxy and Synapse. So Synapse, everyone knows what HAProxy is, right? Um, Synapse, uh, well, for, so this is kind of how it, 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 it works. All of our jobs have, our, our API servers have AuthProxy, they have the API server themselves, and then they have a health check, right? And we bind auth proxy to the public HTTP port, and we bind uh, the API server to the private port. So internally, if someone needs to make a request to that API server because you know, it's a batch job that needs to read that data, they go right to the private port. Someone coming in from the outside world gets sent to auth proxy, and then that proxies them to the API server. The health proxy never needs to talk to HA proxy because that's running in the same Mesos server right next to it. So a request coming in for uh, get HUD API scroll depth or private HUD, HUD API scroll depth goes HA proxy into the Mesos cluster. So the way Synapse helps us out here, um, and Synapse was uh, written by um, Airbnb, thank you. Um, written by Airbnb. And it's, uh, the config is, a, is YAML, and it's a superset of the HA proxy config, right? So Aurora. When a job is launched in Aurora, it announces into Zookeeper that, you know, hey, this HUD API is running. You've got three instances of it, and here's their ports that are defined. HAProxy is polling Zookeeper, or Synapse, rather, is polling Zookeeper, and when it detects a change, it generates a new HAProxy config and bounces HAProxy. Um, this happens pretty quickly, and uh, I know that uh, uh, earlier someone was talking about how there's actually an update to HAProxy, which makes it so you don't lose any connections. But when it bounces, we probably lose a couple. 
Um, all of these APIs are being accessed from JavaScript that's just going to retry the request. So it's not a big deal. You know, it takes like 200 milliseconds to re restart it or something. Um, we use Puppet to manage the HAProxy config and the Synapse config. So if a user needs to add a new route, they'll add it to Puppet uh, and push that out. And it'll get picked up on our HAProxies. Our HAProxies are all uh, uh, running in, in ELB. Okay. So question number two, uh, metrics collection, right? Metric collection is really important. Um, and we wanted to make it easy, right? We had several different ways people were doing this before. Um, they were using uh, you know, everything from TSDB to um, well, all sorts of different ways of, of collecting stuff. So we decided to consolidate everything on, on OpenTSDB and Grafana. Um, OpenTSDB uh, was written by Etsy. Um, I think most people are familiar with Grafana. Um, it's a great dashboard for visualizing this stuff. So our flow is OpenTSDB into Grafana. Uh, Nagios is pulling Grafana and also TSDB directly um, and seeing if something is, is wonky. And then we use PagerDuty for alerting. The cool thing about the naming of all these things in Aurora is that it's very easy for us to say, you know, figure out the, the, the tag. TSDB works with tags. So you have its time series database. You have a time series, you get a point in time, and it has a bunch of tags. So one tag is the name of the job. One tag is which environment it's running in. One tag is what user is it running as. Uh, so that gets very easy to say, well, let me look at the HUD API dev. Now let me look at HUD API prod. Um, because everything is consistently named, we're able to actually write tools that easily let uh, engineers put this data in and also scrape all the data that's coming out of Aurora for the jobs running. So we can generate dashboards for any job, showing how much CPU is it using, how much RAM is it using. Um, all of our JMX metrics also get this data, um, so we can graph things uh, very easily. Everyone knows where to look for any job that's running. Um, so we've written libraries in Python and Clojure that do all of this kind of auto-tagging based on the Aurora names. Um, and we wrote a, a, what we call the JMX collector. Um, which actually pulls any job that's running in Aurora and just pulls out the JMX metrics if there's a JMX port to find and stores them in TSDB. Um, and Grafana dashboards for everything. So, you know, engineers love pretty graphs. So here's our generic Mesos job graph. Um, up on the top, you can see CPU used by task. You can, uh, the red line is the limit that's been assigned. Um, this job is nice, it, it, it peaks a little bit, but not too bad. Um, which is how we like it, right? And uh, you can see if any, uh, any specific tasks are using more CPU than others, um, which is actually happens a lot in Kafka consumers, it, it, especially if you have an unbalanced uh, topic, right? So we can say, oh, this task is, uh, is using way more. Um, one thing we haven't quite figured out how to solve is um, a way to give certain tasks more CPU, but I think that's probably a pipe dream. Um, it's better just figure out how to balance the topic better. So log file analysis. Um, this was actually a really big one for our users. Um, I think mostly because log file analysis has always been kind of tough. Um, when we told users they couldn't just easily SSH in and use polysh to tell all their logs, they were like, no, this is horrible. Um, so we tried to pull everything into Elasticsearch um, with Kibana. And I know some people love it. I hate it. It was, it was really messy and incredibly expensive. Um, so we chose to use Flume um, Athena, uh, which is uh, an Amazon product. It's, it's Presto running in Amazon, um, and something called Tell LLL, because we already had a Tell LL. So what, are, what do those look like? So I mentioned users want a poly. If you're not familiar with PolySH, it's a little Python program. lets you like shell into 10 servers, run the same command, and see all the output nicely separated, um, even with colors. It's really cool. Um, so we wrote this uh, addition to our Aurora client um, called Aurora Managed TLLL and a job name. So since we, have, we know where everything's running from the Aurora client, you can say, hey, I want to tell this job. Um, and it will say, hey, where are these jobs running? It'll log into all of them and, and, and pull back all of your log files and just print them out. Um, the, there is an Aurora web UI to just kind of click on a job and look at the log file, just like in Mesos. Um, but that doesn't help with a cron job that already stopped running or if it got cleaned up. Um, so we suck all of our log files into Athena uh, through Flume. Um, Athena just lets you do ad hoc uh, SQL-like queries across S3 buckets. 
So, you know, if you want to do kind of historical forensic on why did this thing die yesterday, you can just go into uh, Athena and look at the logs. And we have a lot of stuff that's not running in Mesos, so all of those logs go there as well, like our Kafka brokers, our databases. Um, I if I didn't mention, we don't put databases in Aurora um, yet, and I don't think we will. Um, so, two years later, and we're really psyched. Um, we've reduced our on-call events dramatically. Um, we've cut our EC2 instance cost by about 33%. Um, and at the same time, we've built new stuff. It's not like we didn't build new stuff. Um, we actually recently did an engineering survey um, because we couldn't figure out any other way to really measure our KPIs. Um, so we said, oh, let's, let's, let's do a Google survey and ask our engineers what they think. And we asked a bunch of somewhat leading questions, maybe. Um, but they said that they rarely experience blockers deploying stuff, which is great. And it's honestly changed our entire approach to DevOps. Um, one of the most uh, telling examples is, is, is how we use the PEX files. Um, you know, we actually build PEX files for all of our command line tools now. So we have a PEX file that runs uh, uh, S3 command. Um, we have PEX files that run you know, all of our, uh, our, we have uh, command line tools to launch instances and stuff like that, and we just wrote, we do them as a PEX file now. Um, we wrote a thing called um, um, PEX runner, which we, we deploy on all of our machines, which you can say PEX run and give it the name of a job and a git hash, and it'll just download it from S3, cache it locally, um, which we do on our Mesos servers as well, so this PEX, uh, you want this git hash? Oh, I already have it. I don't have to go and get it from S3. Um, and that's really changed the way that we approach uh, bundling our Python stuff. So that's been great. So that's it. Um, I want to leave time for questions, and I have. So uh, awesome. Any questions? Uh, I should say uh, that's our engineering blog, and there's posts about this that get into some more detail. Um, I'm on Twitter, at Armangi, and GitHub, at Armangi, and everywhere else pretty much at Armangi, except at work where I'm Rick. That's it. Thank you.